Um, thanks so much for coming. This is, I hope, can be um, a, a participatory session. Uh, I won't take too much time because I hope we can have questions and, and talk a little bit more informally. But um, I'm Erin Flanagan. I'm the medical director for the Pediatric Palliative Care and Hospice Program for Lightways here in Joliet. Um, I am a pediatrician by training, so full disclosure, uh, but so much of what we're going to talk about this morning um, about palliative care and hospice translates to the adult world as well. Um, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions um, and clarify things if they seem a little bit too pediatric focused, but um, we'll just go from there. So... A show of hands, when you think of the term palliative care, what comes to mind? What things come to mind? Things like, yes, <laughs> end of life, easing pain. Thank you so much for that. Oh, fantastic. Okay, good. Um, typically, uh, when, you, when I've been... Um, involved in the initial consults for patients and they've heard of palliative care, uh, I'm always greeted with a sense of panic, foreboding, and um, you know, a little bit of hesitation because people do equate it with hospice and they do equate it with end of life. And I'm hoping we can kind of separate those two things and clarify um, what is hospice and what is palliative care. So palliative care is really all about improving the quality of life of someone with serious illness. Um, it takes an interdisciplinary team to do that. And I think that's the magic of, of palliative care. Um, there's, there's many different ways that people struggle um, in the face of serious illness. There's the, phys the physical aspects, but there's also the psychological, the spiritual, the emotional, um, the ripple effects on family. And so those are the things that you really need. You know, I, as the physician can, you know, I'm, I'm really good at making sure your pain's controlled and that your physical aspects of your, of your life are optimized so that you can live as well as you possibly can in the face of the serious illness. Um, but I need help. I need our child life specialists. I need our social workers. I need the nurses to help deliver that care so that we're caring for the whole person, um, not just their pain, not just their nausea. Our goal in palliative care is always to help you live as well as you can for as long as you can. Um, and so we're going to talk about things like advanced care planning. We're gonna talk about what your goals are in, in your life and in your care. Um, but those don't have to be scary. They can be part of um, thinking about what your life, what you want your life to be and what you want your life to look like. The key with palliative care also is that it is a collaborative enterprise. We are a cons consultative service. We work with your primary team. We don't take over. We don't kind of have an agenda. We're here as this kind of layer of support for you as you navigate your illness with your primary team of physicians and caregivers. So again, just to emphasize, the, I really wanna emphasize that palliative care is a pursuit of wellness. Um, it's a pursuit of wellness in the face of serious illness in the face of hard things. Um, I don't want to minimize, and we never want to minimize um, what each patient is going through um, because that's that would not be that would be disingenuous to what is actually happening in that patient and family's life. But we're not the gloom and doom service. We're not here to emphasize how how hard things are. We're here to say things are hard. How can we optimize them? How can we make them better? And how can we help you live as fully as you can? Um, palliative care has, is actually now a palliative or a fellowship trained specialty um, since 2008. Um, there are a set of board exams. And so physicians actually, just like cardiologists do a fellowship, so do palliative care physicians. 
So in pediatrics, um, much of the same ideas. Uh, but I think what's important to remember in the care of children is that um, children are not one set of you know, guidelines and approaches to care, just as um, you know, pediatricians take care of children and internal medicine docs take care of adults. Children have, you know, we have children who are infants and we have children who are young adults and what they, what their needs are, are incredibly different. Um, so there's, you know, you can't think of one approach for a palliative care patient, especially a pediatric palliative care patient. So we have to think about where that child is developmentally, where they are emotionally, and what that family unit is all about and how we care for a child in palliative care. Where does palliative care happen? It happens at home. It happens during their hospital admissions. Um, it happens in the clinics. Um, we kind of try to meet that patient wherever they are. Hospice, on the other hand, although often lumped together with palliative care, and you know, frankly, at Lightways, we provide both sets of services. We provide serious illness or palliative care and hospice care. What hospice is, is it's actually a package of benefits um, that allows us to implement a palliative approach to care, but with a little more attention to advanced care planning and with the idea that you know, end of life may be something we need to talk about. It may be days away or it could be years away, especially in pediatrics. Um, children tend to live a little differently with their serious illness than adults do. And so hospice is such a unfortunate and heavily laden word, um, but it, it really just is a form of palliative care for patients that are at a certain place in their disease trajectory, where end of life needs to be a little bit more at the forefront of planning and thinking um, and preparing. A little bit about this last point, um, in, for children under the age of 21, there's something called concurrent care. And concurrent care is, was a statute of the Affordable Care Act back in 2010, which stipulated that patients 21 years and younger should be able to pursue their disease-directed treatments and be able to access their hospice benefit at the same time. And so for any patient who is on public, uh, like Medicaid and, and federally funded programs, those children can get both their hospice benefit and continue chemotherapy, continue their private duty nursing, continue on waiver programs that provide, you know, all the services they need to help continue to navigate and live with their chronic serious illness. Um, we're working on the private industry, the private insurance industry. They are slow to adopt this, which is really frustrating. But um, this is so important, especially in pediatrics, because no parent wants to stop pursuing um, things that they feel are benefiting their child. Even though that disease trajectory may be progressing, um, it may be being slowed by treatment um, that it shouldn't preclude us from being able to address the needs we need to address as that child progresses through their illness. So it's a work in progress. So NHPCO, or the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, came up with kind of diagnostic categories of who would benefit most from palliative care services. Um, and as you can see here, um, the leukodystrophies fit over into this group three. Um, there aren't a lot of options for cure, but where there's intensive palliative treatment and palliative care, patients can live um, a very good quality of life over perhaps many years. Um, the other categories, you know, group one are our patients um, with advanced cancer, um, where there may be a curative treatment, but it may not work. And so what does that mean for those patients? Um, group two, um, those are kids that we really do know that um, their lifespan is going to be extremely shortened. Um, but again, we can maintain 
a high quality of life for those patients, um, even if their life is short. And then group four, um, this is also a group of, of children and patients who have um, something irreversible, something static, something that is not going to be curable or reversible, but with intense, um, aggressive treatment, palliative treatment, palliative care, um, those patients and children can live um, good quality of life. Oops. So a little bit about what makes pediatrics unique. Um, Kids don't tend to have the same kind of diseases that adults do. Adults tend to have a lower number of different kinds of diseases that they have um, as serious illness. Children have, uh, you know, genetic, metabolic, um, as you know, as we are for here today. Um, and each child is so unique and diverse in how they live with that disease. Um, when kids, you know, kids have serious illness, there's less kids that have serious illness throughout the country than adults. So, but for those, you know, smaller number, the acuity is a bit higher. Their care needs are a bit higher. Um, its effect on the family is obviously so profound. Um, Kids write their own story. They, you know, prognosticating for a child, especially a child that develops illness, serious illness early, you know, in their toddlers or infancy, um, prognosticating is very, very difficult. Um, and we want it to be difficult because we don't want to try to kind of put a child in a box of, of prognosis. Children tend to outlive their prognosis, um, I would say. And frankly, with good palliative care, I we see kids outlive predicted um, prognoses all the time. But this is why our you know kids tend to be in palliative care and hospice for much longer um, than adults are. How we assess pain and symptoms is different, obviously, for an infant than it is for a school age child than it is for a young adult. Um, how they how they manifest their pain and symptoms, and how we assess their pain and symptoms, how we communicate. Um, certainly, communication varies from infancy into young adulthood for neurotypical children, but for children that are not neurotypical and who have who need help with assisted communication, um, that is paramount to delivering good palliative care. Is how we optimize that child's ability to communicate. And children tend to live really fully with their serious illness. They tend to really want to, you know, be as active as possible. They want to be playing. That's one of the things we use to know how if a child has their symptoms well controlled. What is their what does their play look like? What does their interaction look like? Um, going to school is such an important piece and part of a child's life, as Nicoletta um, said earlier. And so helping that child be able to attend school and kind of grab hold of what their goals and what, what normalcy looks like for that child is extremely important. And our patients are not isolated patients. They come with a whole family attached to them, parents, siblings, grandparents. Um, and that is, those are our patients too. Um, we need to make sure that certainly the parents are, are getting all the care and attention they need to deliver, to care for their child at home, but those siblings need care too. The siblings are experiencing the illness right alongside um, their sibling and what their experience is and how they're coping. Again, the ripple effects of, um, of illness are profound, and that is something we really need to address. Using the medications that we need to use to help control symptoms are largely, those medications are largely studied. They're all studied in the adult world. Um, we, we, we don't, we're not able to study these medications in children um, for reasons of ethics and research and using vulnerable populations. And so um, there isn't a lot of data about the medications we use. Um, and so as 
clinicians, that makes it a little more challenging when we want to try to use new and innovative therapies. Um, similarly, there are a lot of myths and uh, misconceptions about the use of certain medications for children, um, namely opioids. And, and while I think we all want to have a healthy dose of fear and respect for the use of pain medicines and opioids, um, we don't want to throw the throw them all out because they are part and parcel of how we can get children comfortable and mobile and getting and getting them being getting them able to play and able to go to school. Um, we always want to use the lowest possible dose to produce the optimum and maximum benefit. And usually that means being as active as possible. So we use our medications um, with the goal of quality of life and function, um, optimizing function. I know you just spent some time with about grief and, bere and bereavement, but um, I wanna underscore uh, this point because I think the, the nature of grief and bereavement, um, especially with the death of a child, is unique and is um, something that parents take with them for the rest of their lives. And I feel very, very strongly that how that parent is able, how we're able to partner with that parent and advocate and collaborate together about what their goals are and what their priorities are for their child um, is what is part of that child's legacy. And it's part of how that family and those parents walk in their life after the, that child dies. And so that may mean that we, we come up with sometimes um, unorthodox approaches to um, how we care for that child um, in the last days, months. Um, but if, if we don't pay attention to what's important to the parents as well as the child, um, I think that can risk a very complicated and, and difficult grief journey um, afterwards. Oftentimes people think, and unfortunately in the adult world, there is this idea that we either pursue a curative path or we pursue a palliative path. Um, and I think and certainly in pediatrics, as, as I've talked about, about concurrent care, um, the idea is that the two can coexist, that we don't have to have one without the other, that they're not mutually exclusive. And that gets to a little bit about hope, which is what I really kind of want to focus on for the rest of the talk is um, what does it mean to hope? And is hope just one thing or is it dynamic? Um, is it is it just hope for, you know, a long prognosis or what else do we do we think of when we think of hope? Um, and that's where I think palliative care can be one of those um, one of those items that helps open both doors. That yes, I can hope for a cure. I can hope for um, a long life. But what else can I hope for? Lots of people have tried to create models of of how palliative care and curative care or treatment related um, care can coexist. Um, and I think that even though I've labeled this as pediatric, I, I think that this exists um, for everyone facing a serious illness. Um, you know, you start a diagnosis and you're going to hope for a cure. You're going to hope for more time. You're going to hope for a miracle that you're that one patient that's going to prove, you know, the statistics wrong. You're going to be that 1%. Um, and palliative care is right there with you. Like we're hoping for the same thing. Like we're not here to say, yes, but, you know, you can have this, but, you know, things are hard. That's not what palliative care is about. Palliative care is like, okay, we're going to, we're going to hope with you. Um, but we're also going to hope for these things too. We're going to hope that you have comfort, that you can be as active as possible, that you can live the life goals and priorities that you set out for yourself. Um, and so this period of time, you know, this for some patients, this is weeks, and for some patients, this is years. Uh, but 
here, you know, hospice, like I said, comes in at a period of time. And again, this could be hours, days, months, or years. Um, but this is where, yes, these, these still coexist, but now we're going to think a little bit about what the priorities are about end of life. Um, and then you have, you know, patient death. And then this is an, this is also a very active part of that patient's illness experience trajectory, because this is the experience of the family. I should have said who makes up a palliative care team, not what makes up a palliative care team, but um, this is this is who these teams are. So um, there's the physician medical director, um, you have nurse practitioners, you have nurses, um, you have social workers, and in pediatric programs such as ours, you have child life therapists. Um, are you guys all familiar what a child life therapist is? So a child life therapist is a trained professional. Um, they do postgraduate work um, and they're given, it's a, it's a degreed program um, that focuses on how, what that experience of illness is for that child. And they provide interventions that allow for children to, to navigate and experience their illness without or minimizing suffering, suffering being physical, existential, emotional. So child life therapists are often very, they're prominent people in children's hospitals because they are, they are for every IV stick, for every procedure, for everything that child has to go through. Um, there's a child life therapist to help that child to know that child very quickly and to figure out what it, what that child needs to feel safe and to feel as calm and and kind of cared for as possible. Um, the child life therapists are also, especially in our program where we are providing care in the home, very, very integral to the experience of siblings in the home um, and how those siblings are navigating an understanding of their siblings' illness and how they're navigating their own lives and and what their experience of illness for their sibling is. Um, we have a chaplain who, you know, everyone's kind of afraid when the chaplain visits, but the chaplain is an incredibly important um, part of our care, not only for the spiritual aspects of people's lives or religious, in many cases, the religious aspects of people's lives, families' lives, but they are also this source of compassionate, supportive and addressing the emotional experience of illness for that child, for that set of parents, and also for the siblings. We are so lucky. We have incredible music therapists. Has anyone experienced a music therapist? Um, yeah, we have, we have four now that um, help with our program as well as the adult program. Um, and, you know, music serves as a, as a distraction for sure, but it's so much more than that. Um, music therapy actually has data-driven, verifiable um, physiologic ex effects on patients experiencing illness, experiencing pain and suffering. Um, and they are just, they are such a light in our, in our team. Um, our music therapists also are really important in legacy work and legacy building um, with our child life therapists. They help children and families create legacies. It can be anything from a thumbprint to um, a drawing to a hand mold. And our music therapists provide many different uh, ways they can do legacy work. One in particular is they record the heartbeat of our patient. And then they had, they work with a family to pick a song um, that is memorable or that is important to them. And they synchronize that uh, patient's heartbeat with the song. And that, that becomes an incredibly treasured piece um, for those parents, for that family um, forever. So, you know, I, as the doc, I play a role, but I am a, I'm a supportive uh, cast member. 
you know, we are, we are a team, we are a unit. Um, and at Lightways, you know, our nurses provide home visits, all these folks, we all come into the home, um, for, so for our hospice patients, there's probably somebody in the home, um, three out of three out of seven days. Um, and more often if, if needed. Um, but it's, uh, it's definitely a team effort. I think there's a lot of fear um, when we're first starting to know a family or a set of parents about what we're going to talk about. Um, they're going to make me talk about hard things. They're going to make me talk about death. They're going to make me talk about, and nothing could be further from the truth. But I think what we try to do is we try to give voice to what I think we all think what's going on in parents' heads as they're laying down at night and they're trying to sleep. What are your worries? Um, given what you know, what are you hoping for? What are the what are the priorities? What are the priorities for you as a parent? And what are your priorities as a family? Um, what are the other goals and hopes you have? Um, it's not just one question. It's what are your hopes and priorities? And parents will identify one or two. And then we say, well, what else? And they usually kind of are taken aback because nobody actually asks and pushes them a little bit. And it's amazing when you actually say, well, what else? Like what, it's almost like they're being given this like free gift, like, oh, I can ask for something more. Like I can, I can hope for other things. And I think that speaks to this dynamic and heterogeneous aspect of hope. Um, I, it drives me crazy when when a, a palliative care consult is suggested for a patient and their primary treating doc will say, well, we don't want them to lose hope. Like if you guys show up, they're going to think of some, some, something's really wrong. And you know what? Something is really wrong. Like something is seriously wrong. Like that's okay. It's okay to say, uh, but that doesn't mean that there is no hope. There may have to, there, there should be other hopes. Um, and like I said, in the other you know schematic, we're going to hope right along with you. Like we're going to hope for the cure. We're going to hope for that. You're the miracle person, but we're also going to help explore what other hopes are important to you because you're not just your disease. You're this very complex and wonderful person who has a lot of ideas and hopes and dreams for yourself and for your family. And that's what we're going to zero in on. If we just ask, what are the things that bother you most to the child or to the parent, what are the things that are bothering him or her most? Um, that's a much more helpful question than is how's your pain, you know, or how much nausea they have. Like what's it, what's really keeping you from being able to go to school? Because sometimes the child will say, no, the pain I can deal with. It's the fact that I, my leg is numb and I can't feel like it, I'm very, you know, self-conscious about it. I think in physicians, we do a lot of assuming. We, we assume that, you know, there's, you know, this going on, so this must be happening. And sometimes when we actually sit back and we actually ask, um, it's a various different set of answers that we get sometimes, which is, I think, humbling and important for us to remember. Um, again, this is the language we tend to use with our families. What gets you through? What are your support systems? What gets you through these tough times? What worries you? What keeps you up at night? And sometimes families will answer that straight, you know, straight away. Sometimes it takes a few days or weeks to keep asking, what kept you up last night? What, and, and as you build that rapport, um, you get to know what's, what are the real things we need to talk about, address? What are the hard things we need to address? And like I said, we can we can address them and then we're going to put them on a shelf. We're not going to dwell. We're not going to talk about this all the time, but I know it's on your mind. And if we talk about it together, it becomes less scary. And as I'll show, um, families, they, they don't want to talk about the what ifs, but they do want to talk about the what ifs. They want to talk about the what ifs in a safe and supportive environment, and then be able to move on to the other things that are important to them. Um, 
So this idea of hope, I've been kind of alluding to it, but I think it's it's really, really important um, to us in palliative care that we are not seen as the hope buster or the, you know, the, the want, want, um, because hope isn't all or nothing. Um, it is not static. It is dynamic. It, it changes and it, it morphs and it, it is something that is unique to each very complicated individual. And so, um, yes, we can hope for things, different things as you progress through an illness, but the idea that hope is somehow abandoned or that hope is not part of what we do in palliative care is just nonsense. Um, it's actually part and parcel of what we're doing because we actually don't just focus on hope for a, prog a certain prognosis or a certain outcome. We're going to have we're going to make sure that what your hopes are as a human being are addressed. And I think what's super fascinating to me, I apologize for this slide, but there's just so much research um, and good data about holding hope and reality in the same hand. Um, Jennifer Mack is a palliative care doc and an oncologist at Boston Children's, and she's done incredible work um, in the space of if we give parents, you know, if we're frank and open and honest about prognosis, do they do worse? Like, are they sadder? Do they lose hope? And she's been able to demonstrate that that's really, actually the opposite is true, that actually what helps parents and families is open and honest communication and feeling safe and, and protected in having those conversations. Um, and so this is a, this are a few of her papers and some of her colleagues, um, that good, good communication was associated with hope, even when chances for cure were zero or low, um, that, peace of mind and sense of purpose was not associated with, with good prognosis. That domains of hope shift and change. Um, and what's interesting, when I, I spent most of my career in children's hospitals, in the hospital environment, one of the most common reasons we would get called to consult would be from a bedside nurse who is overhearing and, and, you know, obviously has a relationship with her parents that of the child she's taking care of. And though they would call us and say, I don't think they really understand how severe things are or how short, you know, their child life is. The parents are, are talking about him going to kindergarten. So we need you guys to come in there and to really hit it home to them. And we would say like, okay, no, that's not our, that's not our role. Um, and we would try to, so we would come in and do our consult and I would ask the nurse to be with us as we're talking, you know, in this initial intake of the consult to hear um, that the parents can speak very clearly and very, very um, calmly about the reality of their child situation, whatever it is, but they can also in the next breath, talk about what may not happen, but that's what they're hoping for. And it doesn't mean that those two things are are mutually exclusive. Um, this was this was one of Jennifer Mack's studies where she did interviews and and um, audio interviews, and um, you know this is from one interview. He she know mom knows he's gonna he's gonna die, but I can just hope he'll live a little longer. I'll hope that the tumor will go away. I can still hope for that. Um, and I just want to to lead a normal, happy life. Yet what parent wouldn't hope for that? Um, so that doesn't mean she doesn't know what's happening. It just means she's not gonna sit in that. She's not gonna let that be where she exists because certainly as a parent and as the caregiver of a loved one, that's you, you are holding those two things together um, all the time. So these are some pictures of how we, um, help our kids live well. Um, this, this young woman, young woman, young girl, um, this was her first day of school. 
and she, you know, this was nine months before she, she passed away, but she was going to rock that first day and she was going to just take it on. Um, this young, young lady swam with dolphins three weeks before she died. Um, this is a set of parents of a newborn who they made a bucket list for the life they wanted to have with their, with their baby. And, you know, some of it was very simple and some of it was, you know, a little more complex, but just to make that, you know, I love the listen to ACDC with daddy. It's awesome. Um, but these are a couple of our nurses, um, you know, meeting kids where they are in their home and, um, helping them live with as many smiles, um, as they can for as long as they have. So that's all I have today for you. Um, I hope we can talk a little bit more about, you know, what palliative care is and isn't if you have any questions. Um, but thanks for, uh, thanks for having me.